I had a great 10 minute conversation with him, but that's because he thought I was George Clooney. No way. Well, you had the yeah. suit on? Yeah, I had the suit on. He had his Mr. Freeze. And in the Mr. Freeze, he had contacts on, but I, you know, they black out your eyes. So all that's sticking out is my chin. I'm all, I'm all, I'm all grown up. I- All right, our guest today is a legendary martial artist, actor, stuntman, and author who you may recognize as everyone's favorite undead ninja of the Shirai Ryu clan in Mortal Kombat. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chris Kasamasa. Hey, how you doing today, my man? I'm doing awesome. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. I'm talking to one of my heroes. Ah, well, thank you. It's very kind of you. For sure, man. Well, I'm a bit of a martial arts nerd, so I actually want to start and take it back a little bit and talk about your dad, Louis uh, Kasumasa, starting Red Dragon Karate. Okay, cool. I feel like Red Dragon Karate was definitely a wave maker for what we know today is like American karate, right? And now, of course, there's plenty of people out there who have made their own styles. Some are legitimate and some are not so much. The first dojo I ever trained at was a, an eclectic style. It was a blend of like Shotokan and Goju Ryu mostly. I actually think you know one of my old training partners, Chris Cusinelli? I do, yeah. yeah. Such a small world, man, yeah. So him and I used to train at VIP Karate in New York. Oh, right on. Yeah, the proof is in the pudding that Red Dragon Karate is the real deal. Definitely no McDojo. Your dad, Lewis, is a black belt in seven various martial arts. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Wow, would you be able to name them? I know that Judo and, and Karate are in there. Do you know the rest of them off top? Off the top of my head, I'll do the best that I can. He has uh, black belts in styles from China, Japan, Korea, Okinawa, the Philippines, Indonesia, and like even some Tibetan stuff. So my dad was wow. a kind of a renaissance man. Yeah. And really just fell in love with the martial arts and tried to digest and, and learn all he could about it, um, whether it was physical training, reading and traveling. And he created a, just a network of people that he shared his information with and they shared information with him. And, and uh, you know, in the 1960s, he did something like you alluded to, that was unheard of at the time. And that was, he started mixing styles of martial arts together. And uh, my dad's got some amazing stories about some of the things, like the things that you see in some of the Kung Fu theater movies literally happen back in the days in 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 the infancy of martial arts coming to America as a business. You're talking, you know, 62, 63, 64. There was a lot of stuff that happened during that time that we could never get away with today. I bet. Like one of the classic things would be if you opened a martial arts dojo in a town and there were other dojos there, the owner of those other dojos would come and challenge you. And if you lost a fight, you had to close your dojo and leave. That's wild, man. It was literally like old West style. My dad would tell me these stories. And, you know, as a kid, I got to see and be part of that and and to witness it happening. And uh, so it was crazy, crazy times. And of course, listen, it's uh, 2023 when we recorded this interview. We started in 1965. Yeah. And we've never, we never closed. So my dad was a badass. Like he never lost. Right. Plus my dad was actually really crafty. He would do, he, you know, because people would talk and he would, he would know that there was someone coming to challenge him. And yeah. they would tell him, they would tell him, you can't do this and you can't do that. And one of my dad's favorite lines was, listen, I'm an American. And the last four letters of the word American are I can. You can't tell me what to do. You, I could, this is America and we could do what we want. And if you don't like it, you can get the F out of here. But here's the other cool thing that he would do. Like he was crafty. He knew when another person was coming to challenge you, like the talk of the town, like, oh, so-and-so is coming to challenge you. So he would take his black belts that yeah. he had that were students of his and he'd make them go in the back and put on white belts. <laughs> and then the guy would come to challenge him and my dad would be like, no, no, I'll fight you. But first you have to prove yourself worthy. If you can beat my white belts, I will fight you. Of course, his white belts were badasses. Those were his Holy black belts. Shit. And so it just think about the mind F that you would happen. Like, I'm going to go challenge this guy, but oh my God, his white belts kicked my ass. And you're getting rocked by the white belts. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there are stories like that. And, and uh, you know, it's 58 years of, of history of what we've got uh, going on. That's so dope, man. Well, first, I'm definitely going to carry on with the I can. I never heard that before <laughs> or thought about it. And I do fancy myself a master of wordplay. I'm a rapper and I never even picked up on that. So that's that's fine. Oh, oh, there you go. I know that as an eclectic style, Red Dragon Karate is probably ever evolving. I'm curious as to, is there one traditional style that you would say is closest to a base style for Red Dragon Karate? Probably Shotokan. Okay. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, my dad's first black belt was in judo. Yeah, uh, which which he got at the at the Kodokan in Japan under Risei Kano, who's the son of the founder of judo. But those two probably make up the core of what we do: judo and Shotokan karate. Uh, and then we've got offshoots of the other styles implemented in there. Gotcha, gotcha. I have to say, you're one of the folks that I really still look up to because of 
the legitimacy with which you've like adhered to the martial arts lifestyle. You know, I, I grew up, um, you know, I'm a nineties kid and you know, there's a lot of, you know, and this is not to shade them, but there's a lot of guys from that era who, who really kind of let that go a little bit. And it's just inspiring to see that you've maintained that in your life. I, I don't know if you remember this at all, probably not, but we met for the first time in 2015 at the Anaheim Fit Expo mm-hmm. and you were so cool and so gracious with your time, man. Uh, it really meant a lot to me. I still, you signed a, a scorpion picture for me and it's still up in my house. Ah, that's awesome, man. Thank you. Yeah. Well, listen, along those lines, that's, you know, if you're learning real martial arts, you yeah. learn two, two core things, right? With that being humble yep, and being, and being respectful and regardless of whatever rank I am or whatever title I've achieved, whatever movies I've done, I always try and keep that mindset of being humble and being respectful but, and respectful in the fact of treat people the way you want to be treated. Like I've met movie stars, yeah. you know, I've got to be on set with George Clooney, Arnold yep. Schwarzenegger, Umar Thurman. Like I've got to work with some big people. And for the 99% of it, like they've all been super cool to me. So I always thought like, if someone came up to me and said, Hey, can I have your autograph? I never wanted to be a dick yeah. and have that like, Oh, I'm a superstar. How dare you ask me for it? Like I respect it, especially the mortal Kombat fans. Like that movie came out you know, over 20 years ago now at this point, but I still get fan mail. I still get yeah. requests to go to comic cons and fit expos and go to all these places, but it wouldn't be possible if it wasn't for the fan support. So I love the fans, especially the mortal Kombat fans. And double, especially if you're a Scorpion fan. Sub Zero fan, man, eh, I could do without you. <laughs> but Scorpion fans, like, I, I totally, I, I love it, and I always want to stay humble and respectful. And, and you know, they have questions. I like to give answers. That's amazing, man. That's amazing. I've heard you say that you failed your first black belt test and it was kind of because you took it for granted that your dad was probably going to pass you because he's your dad. And so I imagine that was that's that was a really cool and important lesson that your dad taught you early on. I'm very curious as to, do you remember what aspect you actually failed at? Did you mess up a kata? Was it the physical fitness requirements? Like what made you fail? Dude, all of the above. Wow. Like my The quality of what I was doing wasn't good. Now, look, keep in mind, I was 10 years old at this sure. point, yeah. which was something else that my dad started that never really existed, promoting kids to black belt. Like I started when I was four years old. Yeah. So I had six years of training, Yeah. but I was not really taking it seriously. It was my, I was doing it more to hang out with my dad. Yeah. And the, but the quality of what I did at that time just wasn't up to standards. There were other kids there that night that passed. Right. You know what I mean? And they're I'm like, oh man, I'm the owner's kid and I failed. Yeah. So at 10, I needed that because it taught me an important life lesson. You get what you work for, not what you think you deserve. Right. So I learned that at a young age and it's been with me for the rest of my life. So I'm looking back on it. Like at, at the time, I, I like, I hate my dad. He sucks and blah, blah, yeah. blah. But then looking back on it, like, I'm so glad that he did that because it taught me so much. Yeah, man. It, that completely removes your sense of entitlement. And I, I think that's super important. Yep. Dope, man. Well, okay. So I want to fast forward a little bit. You got spotted at a tournament by the directors of what would eventually be WMAC Masters. So did you move to Orlando for the two seasons that that show was on? I did. Yeah. Okay. And it was being filmed at Universal Studios, correct? Correct. That was in the height of Nickelodeon's heyday at Universal Studios. Did you ever cross paths with people from those shows like all that or Keenan? and Kale or anything like that? No, we did not. We had our own like studio on set there at Universal. It was kind of an in out thing. I mean, we'd get to go around the park and stuff, but yeah. uh, what was cool about that was they made our set part of the tram attraction at Universal. So wow. we'd be filming live action fighting in the thing and the tram would be coming through. That's so it was dope, kind of man. Kind of yeah. Wow. While you were there, did you like to keep training? Did you find a, a local dojo that you were like, this is a cool place to train at? Or were you just training by yourself? Uh, I was training by myself and on set, like they were very gracious and, and the set area that we built that we were filming in. Yeah. It, I mean, it was, they, they built like a martial arts dojo. Yeah. The yeah. WMAC inner sanctum. So we had a place that we could go to, but I mean, we had a regular gym membership that they provided for us too. Um, you know, the, the, the apartments and stuff where we had, had fitness center. So there were plenty of opportunities and places to train, but we were working every day. Yeah. You're talking eight, 12 hours, eight to 12 hours a day. Wow. We're, and we're fighting. Right? And it's like very physical. Yeah. There's some dialogue, but most of our, the action in WMC is fighting. Yeah. So we were doing that every day. So the last thing we wanted to do at the end of the week was, was more train. martial arts training. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes, so the job was the training. The job was the training. Yeah, that's what's up. If I did my math correctly, which is highly unlikely, you were 32 years old at that time. Is that correct? Close. I think I was 30. Just just about 30 at that time, yeah. Okay. So before that point, I've heard you mention, of course, that you grew up on Bruce Lee and stuff and that you definitely mm-hmm. had designs of being you know, a martial arts star. So at that time, about 30 years old, before you got the WMAC job, were you trying before that? Like, Were you looking for agents? Were you going to audition? Stuff like that? Or was that really like your first foray? No, it was not. It was not my first foray. It was my first 
big time that and Mortal Kombat were my two essentially big breaks. Yeah. That helped a lot of other people be aware of me and 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 the talent and what I could do. Yeah. But up to that, I had done a bunch of bit parts. Like I was an extra in a Mickey Rourke uh, vodka commercial. Oh wow. Like whiskey commercial. Yeah. I was I was background in in stuff. I really had to learn the ropes and and I started at the bottom. You know, people they see the end result like, oh, you're in WC, you're in Mortal yeah. Kombat but they don't understand the work that went into it 10 years prior. Right. You know, Cause that's the, that's the thing is it takes 10 years to make an overnight success. In this so business. true. So I was doing, you know, I did small movies like revenge of the ninja shoot fighter, all this stuff prior to, you know, I was a background in the karate kid, the original karate kid. Yeah. Film. I saw that. So I, I had to kind of work my way up. And then again, it's opportunity and skill. Yeah. Right. So my skill opened the door. I just needed the opportunity to be in front of the right people to see yeah. what I could do. And then they're like, Hey, this guy might be good for that. This guy might be good for that. And one thing led to another that way. That's what's up. So when you got on WMAC, did you have representation at that time or did you get it afterward? I got it. That's a good question. I got it right about when I got the gig, okay. I got representation. Cause I had never negotiated a contract like that before. So I needed to get some representation. And then the acting class that I was in, uh, they brought in some casting agents and I talked to them about that. And then, so I was able to get signed uh, to an agency. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. And so at that time, what do you remember your mindset being and specific goals? That's your first big break. You've been, you've been going at this for a minute. Now you're on a show. You're able to showcase your abilities at that time. Looking forward, what were you thinking for the future in terms of like, this is where I want my career to go. These are like some sort of bucket list, list items, like, or were there any of those things or were you just kind of like, I just want to see where this goes. I was kind of more like, I want to see where this goes. And then once I got, and I listen, I almost got both those jobs literally back to back mortal Kombat, believe it or not actually filmed before wmac what so i had this yeah i had this killer like schedule for a year where we got the we got the thing for wmac we filmed the pilot and then they had to edit it and kind of sit on they tried to shop it around and sell it but during that time i'd also got the gig for mortal Kombat. yeah so i was gone to thailand and then we filmed all of that and then that went into editing and then all of a sudden the call from wmac came in and said hey we sold the project we're going to go to Orlando because I remember where I was the first time I saw the trailer for Mortal Kombat. We were sitting inside of Planet Hollywood in Orlando Dope. having lunch. We were on break from the set. We we're on break and Planet Hollywood would always play like the movie previews. Yeah. And all of a sudden that came on the TV and I might my, my, on a big movie screen they had up there, but I had my back to it and all my friends at the table, the other guys in the show, they're like, hey, 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 you're on the, you're, you're on the, and I turned around and I saw it and that was the very first time I had seen it. And so that came out, like we filmed all of WMAC. And then that summer is when Mortal Kombat came out. Wow, man. That's a crazy timeline. Yeah. Talking about Mortal Kombat, I've heard stories about your, your audition there. So I've, I've got a few questions. Number one, when you first showed up, was it like a cattle call style audition? Like they were just mad dudes there? Yeah. Yeah. There were about a hundred guys there on that first one. Wow. Okay. And so you made the risky, but you know, amazing decision to do a flying sidekick over three casting directors twice in a row. Is that correct? That Well, I did the flying sidekick over them to the front. And yeah. then when they turned around and looked at me, I just did a diving roll back over the top of them. That's so fire, man. I yeah. see if that was a casting director, I'd be like, all right, we got to cast this dude on the spot. No callbacks. Like that's, that's a wrap. Yeah. And I, listen, I did it because there were some talented people in the room, you know, yeah. some of them, cause I was, uh, uh, on the professional competition pro tour. So some of the guys from the tour were also there. So, so I'm you like, knew oh, man, this is, yeah. I'm like, this is going to be some heavy company. But the, the funniest part was, and I, and I know you've heard the story, but the funny part was we were all going in to audition for background fighters. Like it was, an, it was going to be another background gig for me. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, I'm just getting my feet wet and learning the ropes and stuff. But you know, because I did that again, opportunity and skill. Yeah. And then I got very fortunate that during my audition, the producer and director just happened to be walking by. They were working on something else. Oh, wow. I didn't know it because I didn't know who they were. Yeah. So again, right place, right time with enough work put in created that that moment. That's amazing, man. Do you recall what was the like when you when you nailed that first fly sidekick over? Do you recall like what their initial was? Everybody shocked, like jaw on the floor. Hundred percent. It's like one of those things you see in slow motion where you just see the the heads go up and the mouths open. Yeah, and they just kind of like watching you go go up and over. Yeah. Uh, so it was funny because I remember them. I remember their heads doing that because they actually thought I was going to hit them right because I'm of running course. at them. And they're like, why, why is this guy running? They're, and by the way, just for the listeners, they yeah. were sitting in chairs. They weren't standing. Like, I'm not that good. I can't jump <laughs> over a full standing person. Uh, but they were sitting in the chairs. 
but they were, I saw the look on their face was like, uh, he's coming closer, he's coming closer. And then when I took off, they were like, just head snapped back and looked over. Wow. And did they give you any initial feedback right after? Like, did they say anything like, yo, that was fucking dope, man? Or was it just kind of like, all right, we'll, we'll be in touch? Yeah, pretty much. Which is, And I thought, okay, well, they clearly didn't like that because they, they kind of do this whole emotionless thing, like no yeah. matter what you do. Yeah, man. You know, it, it's the same response. Like, hey, they clap. Oh, that was good. All right, thank you. Next. Yeah. All right, that was good. Thank you. Next. Right. And then they kind of, I guess they powwow afterwards and they go, oh, here's my top three and top four. Uh, and that's how they figure it out. Yeah. No, I, I feel you, man. Every audition I've ever been to is like that. You you can like yeah. lay your whole heart out and then they're like, cool, we'll be in touch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You made a hilarious casting couch joke at one of your callbacks when somebody asked you to take off your shirt and then you were like, right. well, I'll, I'll go back to your trailer for this, for this part kind of a thing. Right. I'm very curious as to what reason did they even ask people to take off their shirts? Was it legitimately just to see if you guys were jacked? Yeah. The body type. They wanted the right body type because I mean, now the Scorpion and Sub-Zero and all the costumes you know it's all spandex it's all yeah. tight stuff so they couldn't have somebody with a pot belly or somebody that didn't right. fit that mold you know they wanted someone that was that was in shape yeah you know they knew what i could do but they're like no nah, is this guy really in shape so yeah <laughs> so when you made that joke was it just like completely fall flat like dude just was just like staring at you blankly dude i thought whatever this is because i and by the way they didn't tell me what the role was until they said what the role was oh. i just thought the whole time every one of my callbacks yeah because in the beginning, in the opening audition, where they had 100 guys there, their statement was, all the roles are cast. We just need background fighters for a few of the scenes. We want talented martial artists to fill those background things because yeah. we're going to be doing some fighting and cheering and, and cool. Like, I've never been in a major motion picture before. Yeah. Happy to do it. I want to be in the background. So they told us all the roles have been cast. And so, so until my third audition, at the end, when they said, they basically shook my hand and said, welcome to Mortal Kombat. You're going to be Scorpion. I didn't know until that actual moment that that role was even open or available wow yeah do you know who who potentially then if they were saying it was all cast yeah if, i don't and i've asked and they wouldn't tell me so wow okay yeah. maybe, maybe one day we'll find out who knows yeah who knows yeah The original fight with you and Lyndon, it was he beats you in one flying sidekick and the audiences at multiple test screenings hated that, which thank God they hated it because that would have sucked because that's the, for right. me, that's my favorite scene in the movie. Hey, mine too. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, I know that you had to then film that scene again. So I'm curious, one, how long after the movie wrapped was that? And two, did you have to go back to Thailand to do that? Uh, it was about, I'm going to say two months after we wrapped Okay. that we went back and did it. And no, we didn't go back to Thailand. We shot that in Santa Monica inside of an airport hangar. They took over a whole airport hangar. And that, and here's the thing. Computer generation didn't exist in the form that it exists today. Right. That Scorpion's layer that you see in the movie, that was real. Wow. They built that whole thing. And they, I walked into it and I'm like, wow. They took a whole airport hangar and built this Scorpion's layer with the, the bones and the bamboo and stuff all over the place. It was incredible what those set designers did yeah how much of that fight was was lyndon ashby and how much was stunt double about 90 percent was lyndon he really really wanted to do a lot of it you know some of the stuff he, he couldn't do like so, you know johnny cage doing some flips and things like that yeah um but the all the hand-to-hand -hand stuff that's him wow um, that's so impressive yeah, he, he really got into it and and look here's the, he was so dedicated to doing it that he actually started training in martial arts after the movie wrapped Right. With you. So he, yeah. He was a student of mine for almost two years. And That's he got so like dope. He got, he got like halfway to black belt. I was training him a couple of times a week and, you know, then he got other jobs. So it was kind of hard to do, but like he really loved it and, and got into it and wanted to do that part some justice. Do you have any favorite memories from set that you'd like to share? Oh man, I, I listen, I got a, a ton of great memories. The whole experience was just fantastic and, yeah. and just being part of it. You know, working with Lending, getting, getting to hang out with with Robin Shu and, mm -hmm. and Keith and I had known each other already, the guy who played Reptile. Yeah. Um, which, you know, credit to the producer, Larry Kazanoff, which is one of the reasons why I think the film did really well is Larry made it a point to make sure that the fighting roles had real martial arts people in yeah. them to do as much justice to the game as possible. Rather than casting it with famous actors and then trying to double them, he brought in people that would fit that role yeah. that were talented enough to pull off the parts. Yep. And and it just played out really well. And and you, you know, clearly you know this, and the fans of course know this. We were the first video game adaptation movie to make money. Yeah. You know, Double Dragon came out and failed at the box office. Street Fighter came out and failed at the box office. Um, Mario Brothers. Mario the first Brothers one, came yeah. out. 
first one came out and failed at the box office. So our expectations, like everybody thought this is going to tank as well. And then we crushed, we were like number one for the first four or five weeks, number one soundtrack in the country. Yeah. And you know, the, the, and that's a whole nother story, that whole soundtrack, how popular that thing became. But that was, again, it's a perfect storm of, of right place, right time and, and paying homage to the fans that made that game famous. Yeah, man. When you guys wrapped initially, and so it was just that short fight scene, when you left, did you feel disappointed about that? A thousand percent. We, Lyndon and I were, I mean, we were pissed Yeah. because we spent three weeks rehearsing that fight and putting it together and choreographing and, and do it. And, you know, Pat Johnson was the fight choreographer, you know, helped us shape it and, and had these moments of power and, and finesse and what was going to whole big, it was like, so we were really, really upset. And when they called us yeah. to come back to the reshoots, we were like, that's right. We told you. Yeah. What a moment. Thank God. Yeah. And again, again, that never would have happened had it not been for the fan support. Right. Right. It's amazing what that can do. I'm assuming that you didn't do Mortal Kombat Annihilation because at the same time you were already signed on to be the Batman stunt double and Batman and Robin. Is that correct? That, that is correct. And it originally had worked out where I was going to be able to do both. But as movie business goes, schedules change. I had already yeah. committed to... Uh, Batman, which it was a hundred million dollar production, which is nothing nowadays. Right. But then, you know, it's a hundred million dollars. And then it's like, um, let's see, hang out with Arnold, hang out with Uma, hang out with Chris O'Donnell. You know what I mean? Like, um, okay. No brainer. <laughs> yeah, it's a no brainer. Like I, I'm one of maybe 25 people on the planet that's ever actually worn the real bat suit. Yeah. So, and I really wanted to do Mortal Kombat because I love Larry and I love the whole franchise. And, uh, you know, he, Larry and I, and I was, cause I was the first person cast for Mortal Kombat 2 recast. Right. And, you know, Larry and I talked and I said, listen, they're supposed to shoot from, uh, you know, August through it was August, September, October for Batman. And we're scheduled for, you know, April, May, June, July for Mortal Kombat. And then Batman got pushed, Mortal Kombat got pushed. And I go, uh, Larry, I got to uh, take the, and so he was really cool about it. And, uh, you know, he brought me on to other projects that, that we've done and things like that. I was, so I was kind of bummed out that I wasn't in that. Yeah. But at the same time, I was pretty pumped to be Batman. Yeah, man. Is it true that one of the X factors in you getting that Batman gig was somebody telling you you had the same chin as Clooney? 100%. That's what the director said. I had to go in and meet the director. J Joel Schumacher? Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. So, so again, Pat Johnson was the coordinator for Batman and Robin. He, he vouched for me. He's like, listen, this guy can do it. He's yeah. the real deal. He'll do all the fighting. No problem. So Joel goes, I want to meet him. And George Clooney and I exactly are exactly the same height. And apparently we have exactly the same chin. So it all, it all worked out. Worked out perfectly, man. I've heard you say that there were a lot of dope fight scenes in Batman and Robin that got cut, which is really disappointing to hear. I'm wondering, have you ever actually seen that footage? It, wow. I'm hopeful that it's not thrown away, that it exists somewhere. Maybe someday they'll pull it out of the archives, but we shot, listen, they were saying it on set. They were saying those are the greatest fight scenes we've ever shot. Yeah for Batman ever. Like, again, we put in months of work on choreographing those fight scenes and putting it together. And, and listen, the studio made a decision and I understand the decision that they made at the time. Yeah. George Clooney, George Clooney at that time, wasn't a real proven star, right? But Ar Arnold was huge. Uma was already huge. Alicia Silverstone, Chris O'Donnell. They, they were, so that if you go back and watch the movie, which I don't recommend, uh, <laughs> you, you'll see it's more about Mr. Freeze really. And Alicia Silverstone than it is about Batman. Yeah. So they kind of just shifted on what the focus was going to be. Of course, that didn't play out at the box office. People want to go to a Batman movie to see Batman. And then there was the whole bat nipple suit fiasco. <laughs> yeah, and the yeah, whole yeah. Thing. So there was a lot of other factors that maybe, you know, it did great at the box office but compared to all the other Batmans. It was, I think it was the lowest grossing one in the franchise. Right. Yeah, man, that's such a shame because I may be wrong about this, but in looking it up, I feel as though you might have been the first person in the bat suit that was a legitimate martial artist. Possibly. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I couldn't speak to that, but Yeah, probably why those were the best best, you know, fight scenes they they'd ever shot. So, yeah, hopefully, you know, if Warner Brothers is listening, pull those out the archive. We need to see them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You mentioned all those dope superstar names, Arnold, Uma Thurman, George Clooney, Chris O'Donnell, Alicia Silverstone. What was it like interacting with those guys on set, man? I mean, especially someone like Arnold, I can imagine that that's like, a, especially Arnold in the 90s, man. It's like, holy shit, I I made it if I'm on set with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, man. Like like a lot of people at that time, he was one of my like movie heroes too. So yeah. to be able to meet him and talk to him. I had a great 10 minute conversation with him, but that's because he thought I was George Clooney. No way. Well, you had the yeah. suit on? Yeah, I had the suit on. He had his Mr. Freeze. And in the Mr. Freeze, he had contacts on. But, I, you know, they black out your eyes. So all that's sticking out is my chin. And we're, yeah. getting, ready to do, we're getting ready to do a scene. 
And uh, so he's talking to me and he's like, hey, you know, how did I And he's talking to me about stuff. And all of a sudden I realized he thinks I'm George Clooney because I wasn't at his house for dinner. And yeah. I wasn't like, and I'm like, so I'm standing there. And then finally the director walks over and he goes, uh, Arnold, this isn't George. <laughs> and Arnold looks at me and I can't do an Arnold accent. He looks at me and goes, why didn't you say anything? And I'm like, I was just <laughs> excited to be talking to you. I like, I, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> yeah. Who would ruin that moment for themselves? No oh, one. I was like, yeah, I had this great conversation with him, but yeah he thought it was someone else so man that's and, awesome and, and by the way everything you hear about george Clooney is true nicest guy in the world um very very gracious and 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 just very kind and, and giving and you know i met him and i wasn't his original stunt guy the, the guy that was supposed to do the some of the bad stuff that i did had gotten hurt on another movie so yeah. again it was kind of a door that opened for me so george didn't know me and wasn't really sure of what i could do then he came to set and he watched the rehearsals yeah and then he came up to me, he goes, you're going to make me look good. And I go, that's my job, sir. I'm going to make <laughs> you look awesome. So after that, it was like, it was like really cool. And I get to have lunch with him and stuff. So it was nice. Man, what a fire experience like to have just in the resume. Wow. Yeah. In the new Mortal Kombat movie that uh, recently came out, Scorpion was played by Hiroyuki Sanada, who is also amazing. And I thought to myself, the Mortal Kombat 11 video game presented the idea of a uh, multiverse, or maybe that's not an accurate term, but it's, it's alternate timelines. But the opportunity exists and storyline exists for multiple Scorpions to be in one franchise or to be in one project so i'm very curious because i and i also think that'd be perfect for a film right now because of all the multiverse stuff that's been going on has anyone approached you about that or have you been approached about any mortal Kombat projects at all recently no but i'm going to tell you what i tell everybody that says that because i agree with you and just like the even the scorpion skin from the 95 game is not in they have other skins in from the game from the mortal Kombat game but what's up with scorpion what's with the boycott what's so the I tell deal? all yeah. the fans I'm like, you need to just contact Warner Brothers. Go to Warner Brothers Entertainment or Warner Brothers Pictures and tell them what you want because the fans decide if enough people go out and go, put Scorpion in and get a multiverse or put the skin in the game, eventually it's going to happen. Yep. You know, so it's up to you guys. Okay, well, we're gonna. I'm going to take that seriously. It. By the way, I would do it in a second. I would love to put that suit back on and be back in that thing. Um, you know, it's a thing that really brought me to the table, so I'm happy to redo it, and I can do it even better now. Yeah, okay, well, let the record show then that Chris Casamassa is ready to go as soon as Warner Brothers is ready to go, so let's make it happen. That's it. You did a reaction video to a scene from that 2021 movie, and at the end, you said... I know Cole's coming to Hollywood to meet Johnny Cage, but he'll find me. Were you just joking then? Yeah, I was just joking. God, when I saw that, I, I was like, oh, I wonder if that means that he, you know, he knows something that we don't know. But okay, we'll get there. I've heard you say that Raiden was your favorite character growing up. Scorpion was your second favorite. And I'm curious now if you've kept up with the games. Is that still the case? Uh, it's the other way around. I'm still Scorp Scorpion first and then Raiden. Okay, okay. For obvious reasons. Of course. I want to talk about Mortal Kombat Conquest for a second. I feel like that was an idea that was ahead of its time because now with streaming services and better marketing, there's a lot of successful show spin-offs of movie franchises. Obviously, I think Disney's done an amazing job with, with Marvel and Star Wars doing that. But even the John Wick spin-off is going to come out, the Continental TV series. So Mortal Kombat Conquest I think now has more power than it even did at that time. Have you ever written it all or have you ever tried to like get behind spearheading some of these projects? Yes. You have. Is there anything that you'd like to share? Not at this moment. Okay. That's exciting potential. There is some exciting potential that could be happening in the next six months. Wow. Okay. I'm, I will be looking out. I'm very excited for, to hear that. Fingers crossed, man. Who are your favorite peers that you have worked with? Wow. Well, listen, my, my favorite peers that I worked with really are a lot of the other stunt guys. You know, one of my one of my favorites was J.J. Perry, who mm -hmm. played Sub-Zero in the uh, in the Conquest TV show. And then he actually got to do some Scorpion stuff in the second one when I wasn't there. Yeah. Um, but he's he's just an awesome dude. He just recently directed a film with Jamie Foxx, the vampire one day shift. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, that was that doing, was great. Uh, yeah. 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 So he's doing a lot of stuff. He's doing some really great stuff. Um, him. You know, the, the other actors I mentioned were great to work with, but the really the people that you don't see on camera yeah. are the real people that I look up to because they're the ones that, you know, the directors, the producers, the things that people who put these things together behind the scenes. Yeah. You know, because there's, listen, there's a ton of horror stories of of bad sets and bad crews and oh, things yeah. like that. And, and knock on wood for me, I've never been a part of one. All the TV shows, all the movies that I've ever done, the cast and the crew have always gelled together and the projects have gone on to be really good projects. So yeah. 
those people I really look up to a lot and respect them for the work that they do. That's awesome, man. Who are some of your peers that you have not worked with that you want to? For me as a fan, I would love to see you in fight scenes with Van Damme, with Michael J. White, with Scott Atkins, Ernie Reyes Jr. I'm curious, it's like, what's your top three if you were going to choose like guys I've never fought on screen, but I want to? Dude, I would take all three of those guys in a second. I would love to do, I'd love to, I would love to do something with Keanu Reeves, right? That'd yeah. be cool, right? Um, yeah. Um, so anything like that. And of course, like who doesn't want to work with Tom Cruise? Yeah. Yeah. Facts. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, but like, uh, Scott Adkins, those guys, uh, Donnie Yen, I'd love to do something with Donnie Yen. Hell yeah. Right. And then, uh, you know, there's a guy, I don't know if you know, uh, Mike Mo. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Mike Mo. And I just, I saw him at a convention. We were talking about maybe doing something together. He's a guy that played Bruce Lee in once upon a time in, in Hollywood. If you haven't, if you're listening, you're like, who's Mike Mo? He's the guy that actually played Bruce Lee in that in that film. He did an awesome job at it. So good. But I'd like to do something with him. Yeah. That'd be amazing, man. You know, you just brought up Keanu Reeves. I've actually been pretty shocked, especially after I saw the last one. I'm a huge John Wick fan. And at this point, like, they're really going through, like, the who's who of martial arts actors. And I was shocked that you haven't been a part of the franchise yet. I'm curious, have you ever worked with Chad Stahelski? And two, were you ever approached at all so far about anything to do with the John Wick franchise? Well, no on the John Wick franchise. And there's a couple reasons for that. One, I've gone on to become a pretty successful entrepreneur. We've got 15 locations here in Southern California. Yeah. So my, my attention to the movie industry has shifted in another direction i still do it you know i'll do one or two film projects a year but my attention's not really on going out and getting roles the second part of that is hollywood is a very click type of company thing it's yeah. it's not who you know it's who knows you sure and those stunt guys in the crews that, that work on those films you know like especially john wick they're a very tight-knit crew and they are awesome at what they do so if you're not really in that crew, you're not really going to get asked to do something, right? which is cool. And I get it. The answer, yes, I worked with Chad. Chad was on Batman and Robin. Oh, wow. Um, so I know him. I know I know a lot of the stunt guys uh, and the stunt crews. I just am not out actively chasing those things sure. because my, my interest is to shift to other areas. Okay. But if you were approached, you'd be ready to do it. 100%. Well, I'm ready. 100%. I'm still training and still active yeah. uh, and still doing that. I'm definitely not sitting on my rear end doing nothing. So. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Dope. I want to take a second to talk about Jason David Frank. May he rest in peace. I know that yeah. he was a student of you and your father's and that you got Jason the audition for Power Rangers. What was he like as a student? And you know, did you notice early on that he, you know, he seemed to be really good and he was, his abilities were standing above his peers? Like what was that like teaching him? Yeah. His abilities at the time weren't really standing above Above his peers but he was very dedicated and committed yeah um in in japanese we have this term called budo kichi guy yep. which essentially means dojo rat like yeah. we had to kick him out of the school every night he would never leave yeah so he was super you know committed and and dedicated that way and that showed i mean his talent started to shine and, and to rise because he was spending more and more time at the studio so yeah, he was he was uh, you know an awesome dude and uh, awesome guy and went on to be even more successful than me, which is awesome because I get to say I taught that guy. Yeah. Um. So you know you know and and unfortunately he's not with us anymore. But yeah, awesome guy and uh, nothing but great things to say about him. That's what's up, man. Would you tell us a little bit about you getting him the Power Rangers audition? Yeah, sure. We were you know I had my agent at that time and uh, he and I were running a studio together uh, here locally in Southern California. He was working for me. And uh, my agent called and said, hey, they're, they're getting ready to cast this TV show, Power Something or Another, but they're looking for people who are, who are over 18 but can play you know, between 15 and 17, like high school age. Do you have anybody that fits that? And I, and I go, well, not me. He goes, no, dude, you can't play a teenager. <laughs> I go, yeah, I can't. Um, because do you have any of your black belts? I go, yeah, I got a couple. I got a guy. And uh, I sent Jason down. I sent a couple. We sent like three people to the auditions, but Jason got it and, and got the part. And the rest on that is history. Wow, man. That's look at that. Yeah. The only bad part was he came back and he goes, Sensei, hey, I um I got the job for Power Rangers. And I go, Oh, that's awesome, man. Congratulations. He goes, Yeah, but I, I I can't work here anymore. I go, You didn't give me two weeks' notice. You better be here tomorrow. <laughs> love it, love it. I have heard you say before that you were a part of Legend of the White Dragon. Is that correct? That is correct. We were supposed to do a, a P Jason had a part in there for me, but again, my schedule working on another project kept me from doing that project oh no so we agreed that yeah we agreed that we were going to do the sequel and yeah. have a much bigger thing it was going to be like a john wick thing like i was going to be the main baddie for that one yeah but uh it just you know unfortunately passed away so that's never going to come to happen because i never got to do anything on film with him yeah which is so sad 
man. Yeah. Does there exist somewhere footage of you guys training, like when he was younger? I mean, maybe his parents like taping oh, yeah. black belt tests, that kind of stuff. It probably does, right? Oh yeah. 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 I'm sure there's some VHS tapes somewhere. Wow, man. I'd love to see it someday. I heard you mention a movie once you were working on called Raptor and you described it as a cross between Lord of the Rings and Matrix. So ever since you said that, I've been on pins and needles, wanted to see that movie and I never heard anything about it again. So can you tell us what the current status is? Well, listen, here's the thing with movies. Generally, it takes anywhere from one to five years to get a project made if you're not backed by a big studio. Yeah. That project, Raptor, has now become a different name. It's called Fortress of the Fearless. Okay. Fortress of the Fallen. Fortress of the Fearless, I think. Um, and it's still in the works. So they're in some pre-production planning, rescript writing, but uh, the movie business moves slow unless you're like a Marvel or DC project. Then things sure. tend to move fast and forward. So it's still going. I just don't have the when yet. Okay. All right. Well, fingers crossed. I'm looking forward to seeing it when it does come out. Thank you. I was wondering, would you be comfortable sharing maybe one or two of parts that you've auditioned for that you didn't get that you really wanted? Wow. Um, no retreat, no surrender. Oh, wow. Uh, I was up for consideration of the main good guy role. Wow. Which was one of Van Damme's first uh, yep. thing. And, then, and they, they cast this other kid. But And I didn't know about that until years later when I met the casting director. And they go, you know, we were going to go with you. And then we decided to go with this other guy instead, blah, blah, blah. So that was cool. Um, other ones, not that I can really think of that I had an opportunity to audition for. No. No. Okay. Well, that's a good one. Nothing Nothing really. I, again, yeah, I've been, you know, you get in the in the movie business, you have to get used to one simple word. And that word is no. Because you get a, you get a ton of rejection, right? And really... It's you get rejected, you move on, and there's always the next project. And and the no isn't because you're not good for the role. It's just you're not the person they're looking for. You know, they're looking for body types or or ethnicity types or or personality types. Plus, you know, your acting ability's got to be able to to go with that. So it's really not because the casting director has a job. They have to fill the role with the vision of what the writer and director have in mind. Yeah. So sometimes you're right for it and sometimes you're not. And that's okay. And, long, as long, and again, that's part of the martial arts, right? It teaches you to deal with overcoming adversity. And, and because you can take it personally. Yeah. You know, you're like, oh my God, they don't like me. I'm a terrible actor. And oh my God, I'm so, I suck at this. So it's easy to go down that rabbit hole, which is one of the things that I love about the martial arts. It's always kept me from going down that rabbit hole because yeah. I knew how good I was. I knew how talented I was. I knew where I wanted to go. Yep. And I understood every no leads me to a yes. Yep. And it only takes one yes to change your whole life. And that's exactly what happened to me. Big facts. You know, one yes for Mortal Kombat leads to, leads to WMAC, leads to Blade, leads to Batman and Robin. So it, it just becomes a snowball. And sometimes people are willing to put in the work to get to that yes. And sometimes people take that rejection too hard. Yeah. Got to have thick skin. Yeah. I want to take a second before we wrap to just shout out. You've got a couple books out called Bullyproof Fitness uh, and Bullyproof Life. And I just think that's mm -hmm. amazing, amazing stuff that you do because as a victim of being bullied myself growing up, um, it's a topic I'm very passionate about. I've heard you say that you don't even keep the profit from it. It goes to charity. And, mm -hmm. I, and I, I just think that's awesome, man. I think especially these days, I don't know if it seems like the bullying problem has gotten worse or if we just hear more about it because there's more avenues to hear about things like social media or whatever. But the more that's out there, resources and just people knowing that they're not alone, I think is great. So whoever's listening to this podcast, if you've got kids, I highly recommend checking those out. Yeah. And I'm in the process of writing a third book in the Bully series, but this one's going to be specifically for kids. And it's going to be kind of like an animated one that we're yep. doing uh, to walk them through the steps of of becoming bullyproof, uh, kind of in a cartoony type of uh, oh, wow. format. So that's going to be great. Yeah. Because the first two books were they were made for parents to help with their kids and there's stuff in there that kids can read. And there's some cool self-defense stuff that I put in there as well. But this is going to be essentially a children's book about and for bullying. For kids. Oh, that's perfect, man. That's dope. Yeah, thank you. Cool, man. If there was one thing from the nineties that you could bring back, what would it be? Ooh, <laughs> the laser disc. I don't know. Hey. I really, I, you got me stumped <laughs> on that one. Yo, that's a good answer. Laser disc was a great format, man. Very underrated. Yeah. Yo, Chris, I got to say thank you so much, man, for taking the time out of your day to chat with me. This really meant a lot. And thank you for continuing to be an inspiration for me. Yeah, man. Th listen, thanks for having me. Thank you for doing your research. By the way, you did some great stuff there. You had some good nuggets. And uh, I appreciate it. And I, I do appreciate the support from you and, and from all the fans. It means the world to me. So thank you. For sure, brother. For sure. Ladies and gentlemen, until next time, I'm all grown up. Psych! I'm all, I'm all, I'm all, I'm all grown up. Psych!